Welcome to the Whiskey, Jazz, and Leadership Podcast. Subscribe now so you don't miss a drop of straight talk you can't get anywhere else. We discuss the whiskeys to drink, music to listen to, and what it really takes to be an effective leader. I'm your host, Galen Bingham, the leadership strategist. Tonight's guest, author, radio personality, and professor of jazz history at Loyola Marymount, Los Angeles, Eddie Becton. Hey, what you drinking? Okay, we're going we're gonna to jump right into this one. There are a couple of situations that you might roll into that you feel like this is just way too good to be true. That's exactly what happened to me. I'm rolling through my local vinyl shop. I'm getting really into vinyl again. And I just decided to go in there and, and look for some vinyl. And so I roll over to the jazz section, uh, I, I think you guys might be shocked to understand that I might be strolling over to the jazz <laughs> section. And this guy comes over to me and he says, you know, hey, what, what are you looking at? And uh, hey, just getting started. And he started kicking out all of these greats that I was embarrassed to know that I wasn't really as educated as this guy was coming. And so I finally said, you know, hey, look, would you mind having this conversation with my listeners on whiskey, jazz and leadership? He agreed. And when I got his information, his bio, oh, my gosh, this this is too good to be true. I've been longing for this conversation because as we talked, we usually hit the leadership part pretty hard. You know, I pride myself at hitting the whiskey pretty good, but the jazz, I do what I can, when I can, with whom I can. Mm -hmm. And I'm just really excited to welcome you into the room to hit us with some real, real jazz history, legacy, expertise. Come on in, man. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Galen, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here. I, I had to contain myself while you were doing the introduction because I, my heart was smiling literally and figuratively because how we met. The record store was Vintage Vinyl, and I spend an inordinate amount of time at Vintage Vinyl. That's like, I call it my home away from home, right? Typically, it's in the jazz section, but there's some other genres of music that I enjoy. So when I go to the jazz section, I am there. I literally go from A to Z in the albums. And then we'll go to A to Z with the CD. So typically, I don't like going with other people <laughs> for their good, not for mine, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so when I saw you there, just I was like, okay, I see somebody, you know, walk because you know how the, the jazz area is different. It's in the ba- that part of the store. So so let me just walk up to this gentleman because that's I'm just like the social being. Hey man, what, what, what did you pick up? I don't remember what the albums you had, but when I saw them, I was like, oh yeah. I've got to talk to this man, you know? <laughs> so for me, that's part of my personality. That's my history in terms of this music being embedded in my soul since I was a kid. So for me, it was just refreshing to be able to have a conversation with someone who actually, uh, again, I don't remember what the albums were, but I could tell by the albums, okay, this guy, he knows his music. That was the point of departure for me. That opened up everything, man. So thank you for allowing me the space and to Absolute, be with you in your space. Absolutely, man. Well, we gonna get into some real, uh, some real conversation, and I've got my pen and my paper to take notes. But one of the key questions, and a lot of times people say that this is the most important question: What you drinking? <laughs> the closest thing I can find. <laughs> Of the season. Uh, I'm mainly beer and wine, actually, but some friends of mine turned me on to the Uncle Nearest, 1884, and I love the story behind it. So when I do drink like whiskey or anything like that, uh, I keep some. So again, mainly beer and wine, but when I have guests, I like to, you know, for people who have a different palate, 
So I've got uh, I got some Jack Daniels. I've got some Uncle Nears, some champagne, kind of the whole thing. But when it comes to whiskey, bourbon, I like the Uncle Nears and I love their story, too. I tell you, Uncle Nearest has definitely become one of my favorites. I see, I, I feel like I talk about it almost mm-hmm. every episode. But this mm-hmm. is this is season two, so I'm going to try to reform. I am stalking Fawn Weaver and Victoria Butler. Butler is their master <laughs> right. blender. We keep having near misses. I'm going to get one of them on this yeah. on this yeah. podcast yeah. to have that conversation. Since I knew you were coming. And just anticipating the richness of this conversation, I decided to reach for the tippy tippy top of my shelf. Mm -hmm. And I am going with some Old Forester. It's just a good, stable brand, been around a while. There are so many versions and derivations of Old Foresters that uh, I just really, really enjoy. But I decided Mm -hmm. for this one, I needed to have something special. So I'm going to go with the Old Forester. Birthday Bourbon 2016. As I enjoy this, talk a little bit more about your background because I I can't think of anyone with as deep of a musical background and history. Just share a little bit about all the things that you've done and the depth of your jazz history knowledge. Okay. I've always been trained academically at least, when you tell a story or you're describing phenomena, try as best as possible to make a historical connection as it relates to today's milieu. That's to say, what happens today didn't pop out of a vacuum. There's some historical background. So for me, uh, at least musically, when I was a kid, man, so when I say kid, I'm talking about six, seven years old. My father was like straight ahead jazz, right? Ella Fitzgerald, Duke Ellington, Louis Armstrong, straight ahead. Oh, I'm sorry. My mother was like that. My father had a broader palette. So my father like loved the classic jazz, but my father also, you know, Traffic. I remember that as a kid. Traffic was one of his favorite groups, Eric Clapton. So his palette was more broad. So I got this amalgamation of sounds. And I literally used to sit in front of, you remember back then they had those giant wooden consoles that had the turntable and the speakers all in, uh, sit in front of that and rock back and forth for hours on end. Just listen to some of this classic music. So by the time I got to high school and especially by the time I got to college, I had all these musical tastes and people would turn me on and I would turn them on to different types of music. So I did some DJing, whenever people have parties. Hey, Eddie, what kind of music should I play? And of course, I had my own preferences. Now, that's college. And then kind of fast forward, uh, I moved to Los Angeles eventually, and I was teaching the history of jazz in America at Loyola Marymount University. And that came about because I was connected with the jazz community. So I would have these like iconic people come into my class to just do a lecture. And so one of my colleagues from another colleague had reached out to me and said, hey, I've heard a lot about what you're doing uh, in your class. Would you be interested in doing a jazz radio program? And at that time, I'm sure you can relate. When you're younger, you're like we were talking about uh, uh, before we got on air more perhaps willing to negotiate space. But as you get older, you're very clear on what you will do and what you want to do. So when I was approached to do the radio program, I said, you know, if this is a program where it's, it's like robotic and you're going to give me a list of songs to play, I'm not interested in that. Mm-hmm. If As long as I abide by FCC rules, am I going to have the autonomy to bring in not only like world-class type of musicians, but local musicians who normally would not get, there's like a, a public radio station, who normally would not get any airplay. And I'm going to have uh, community service types of programs, like talking about foundations that help jazz musicians who were, you know, perhaps down on their luck or just got hit by a regular life. And so I said, if you want this jazz program to be 
a reference or a, a, a resource for the community, count me in. But if you want me to just spin music that somebody else told me to play, I'm not interested, but thank you. And she jumped up literally out of her chair. Where have you been? This is exactly what we want. So pairing the teaching of jazz history with the radio program, that thrust me to a certain level into a new stratosphere. So we had people that I literally grew up listening to, like Ahmad Jamal, Charlie Hayden, or Silver. So to have access to these cats who I never, likely never would have, and to have Ahmad Jamal be a guest on my show like twice. But again, going back to the roots, if you will, it all started when I was a kid, sitting in front of that giant piece of furniture and listen to some of this classic music. Ah, oh, this is what really got me excited. The people that you have met, the people that you have talked to, oh, man. you know, and I'll tell you the artist that I was really, really starting to get into when I met you was Horace Silver. I, I think I heard one cut on satellite radio mm -hmm. and I was just really enamored. And so that mm -hmm. was my mission the day that we met. And you right, were right, like, right. okay, you need to, you need to get these three. <laughs> this is what you need to yeah. listen to first. And then to understand that you've had connections with Ahmad Jamal, this is gonna this is gonna date me. Might even sound strange, but the first jazz album I remember listening to, it, it might not have been the first one that I listened to, but mm -hmm. it's the first mm -hmm. one I remembered was Les McCain, Swiss Movement, and for me that just became the definition of what jazz music is. To mm -hmm. sit here with me interviewing someone who's actually had a conversation with my foundation of jazz music. That is just yeah. amazing. What was it like to interview folks while they were at the peak of, yeah. Yeah. of being icons in, in that genre? Let me go back to Les McCann. That anecdote, you know, sometimes I ask myself and, and also give my, count my blessings for it. Cause it's like, wow, the creator put me in a space to do something that I truly love, right? So I'm grateful in that regard. The Les McCann story, man, it's, it's almost Linda, Linda Sam, but I think she got married, like remarried, the last name of Linda Sam. And so she uh, developed a program called the Living Legends of Jazz. So what the program was about, or is about, because it still exists and does very well, is honoring our iconic musicians while they're here, as opposed to like, Stimulously, right? And so Les McCann was getting an award. And so I was like, I got to be there. For, and I knew the date because I was connected to the jazz community. So I knew the date of that event. So I reached out to a friend of mine and another friend of mine and said, look, before that award ceremony, you have got to help me get Les McCann on my radio program. It's called The Jazz Journey. And, I, and so I got my introduction to Les McCann was my mother. She loved like, his music growing up. So as a kid, I've listened to all types of Les McCann music. So miraculously, however you want to look at it, his publicist called me and said, yeah, you know, we've got the program, come to war ceremony, and I understand you're interested in interviewing Mr. McCann, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, that's an understatement. Please <laughs> let me interview him. Okay, so fast forward. It was August 18th. Uh, I don't remember the year, I want to say 2013, maybe 14. And August 18th is significant is because that's my mother's birthday. And you know how it goes. Sometimes the real interview happens when you're off the air or post air. So pre-air, I'm talking to him and say, hey, Mr. McCann, you know, I got introduced to, you, to, to your music when I was a kid, blah, blah, blah. And I'm talking about all these albums that have impacted me. And Les McCann, if you don't know, is really up front. And that's being diplomatic. He's raw. He says, uh, damn, man, you know more about my music than I do. <laughs> right? <laughs> so we hit it off right off the bat. And I said, Miss McCann, it happens to be my mother's birthday. Remember, this is in Los Angeles. And my mom lives in St. Louis. So it's my mother's birthday. Will you please do me the honors of saying happy birthday, Betty Beck? And he's like, sure, man, no problem. And so I do my introduction to my show. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got the iconic Les McCann. Before we say another word, Les McCann bursts into happy birth. So he sings my mother and all the verses, not just one, one or two verses, sings all the verses to my mother. 
my cell phone is blowing up and my text, my mother's like, is that Les McCann singing happy birthday? (laughs) It was so funny. But the dude, one of the most genuine cats. Now, fast forward a week after the broadcast. My show used to, uh, it ran on Sunday. His publicist had reached out to me either Monday or Tuesday and says, Mr. McCann had so much fun on your show. He would like you to present his award to the Living uh, Living Legends Award ceremony. Man, almost dropped my phone. I'm looking at the phone. My father was a uh, practical joke. So I'm looking at my phone like, okay, somebody playing a joke on me. Sure enough, man. So when I presented him the award, man, that was one of many highlights musically Mm -hmm. that I've had in my life. It was just amazing. The same thing with Horace Silver, to present him with the Jazz Journalist Association Award, Lifetime Achievement, type of thing. Hey, man, it was just mind-boggling. And then an icon that we lost just recently uh, to Korea. Oh, yeah, yeah. Another warm and generous spirit. I met Chick the first time at, this was in L.A., and uh, it was at a club. And I was writing, I was the co-founder of this, of the print version of All About Jazz in Los Angeles. Fred Young was the founder. So he and a a few other people, we helped get it off the ground. The print version, the online version was already in fact, which is operated out of New York with uh, Ricci. So at that time, I was kind of developing my reputation. So people like, you know, who is this young dude? Never heard of you. It's kind of interesting how it started out like that. And then later on, it became, hey, Eddie, do you remember me? I want to be on your show. Or can you do an article about me? <laughs> mm-hmm, <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. But it came out of the experience with writing for All About Jazz. So I was doing reviews of all these cats, from local cats to internationally renowned cats. My cup has been full, man. And mm. I'm just so blessed in that regard. I might be able to get close to where you are in a few years relative to being a fan of jazz. You're actually a professor of the history of jazz. Tell me what that's about. If I were to sign up for one of your classes and you were to come in on the first day and say, okay, here's the, here's the syllabi for what we're going to be talking about over the next several weeks, what would be some of the things that would be covered in your course? You know what? Whatever course I'm teaching, uh, so the, the history of jazz, that was one of the class at Loyola Marymount. And I'll be back at L virtually teaching intro to African-American studies classes. And whatever class I'm teaching, I always start out with, why are you here? Is this a requirement? Is it because you're curious about the topic, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I usually get into that kind of, that's the foundation for whatever topic I'm, I'm teaching. In terms of the jazz piece, I'm from that train of thought of what we call experiential learning. You know, you learn more effectively or efficiently by touching, seeing, doing, and being an active participant versus me, you know, being this kind of old stogie dude coming behind a professor, uh, but come behind a podium. Today, we're going to talk about Miles Davis and Thelonious Monk. Nobody <laughs> wants to hear that. They want to interact. So typically what I would do the first couple of days of class if these are like undergraduate classes, I may play, I'll never forget this. One time I did the, one of the probably second day of class, I did a lecture and I just walked into the room. So the students were already, I just walked in and put a song on by Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg. Kind of, it has this epic kind of introduction. I think it's called the aftermath or the next episode or something like that. And it starts out, dun, dun, dun. Da, 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 right? So I call it fishing. So when they when they heard that part, they're like, oh, I'm not gonna walk into class, start, you know, and start out talking about Thelonious Monk epistrophe, right? Or sketches of Spain by Miles. I'm not gonna do that. I'm going to try to speak to them in a language they understand first, right? So a language thematically and not necessarily verbatim. I put the song on. And now instead of them thinking I'm in this, you know, boring jazz class, I got their tissue. Boom, right off the bat. And so I say, who is this? Ah, that's Dre and Snoop. Okay, where did it come from? Ah, Dre and Snoop. No, it didn't. So the original comes from, don't quote me on the year, but I want to say maybe 1963 or something like that. And the cat is David Axelrod. 
And for the old heads who listen to your podcast, they will remember David Axelrod being on the TV show called The Man from Uncle. It was kind of like that I Spy. Remember Bill Cosby, I Spy? It was kind of on that vein in terms of these two gentlemen. They were, you know, spies, if you were, counter spies. David Axelrod was trained as a, like a European concert pianist, but he also played a little jazz. Dr. Dre and Snoop Dogg sampled. Now, if you look at a picture of David David Axelrod, he's like this geeky looking dude. And I put his picture up there like, that's who Snoop and so Snoop and Dre sampled from, from like the 60s or whatever it was. Once I was able to get their attention, then I could slowly move into, you know, some of the more bass. I say, for example, on a hip hop, uh, in the hip hop genre, a tribe called Quest. Well, their music, a lot of their music is steep in the jazz idiom. That's uh, my introductory approach, if you will. That's my approach. Oh, man, I tell you, and, and I can so relate because my when I was first introduced to John Coltrane, I appreciated who he was, quote unquote, supposed to be. But I didn't really I didn't really get it. I didn't really understand it. So I took that that John Coltrane and I just put it on my shelf. I went on about my journey and Mm -hmm. and you got really into Miles, got really into Marcus Miller, you know, just really started progressing. And uh, the more I developed my palate, to your point, I really began to appreciate what John Coltrane was doing. And the same thing happened to me with Miles Davis. One of the first uh, Miles Davises that I picked up was Bitches Bro. And I, I got it because uh-huh. I understood the significance of what it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. Boy, I tell you, I put it on. I didn't, I didn't quite get it. I didn't understand right. it. And then I had to go back and get into kind of blue, uh, mm-hmm. get into uh, just more progression of mm-hmm. some Miles mm-hmm. Davis stuff. And then I got into his Dubop album. And then I went back and I got into Sketches of Spain. And that became uh-huh. really one of my favorite. And then I said, well, hey, you know, I got this bitch's brew that, that I've had for a while. Let me put that on again. And now mm-hmm. I get it. Now I can appreciate yeah, yeah. what he was doing. So it, it really, very similar to my palate for whiskey. When uh-huh. I first got into whiskey, my father-in-law was hitting me with some pretty sophisticated blends that I just mm-hmm. didn't appreciate. I, I wish I could go back in time. <laughs> talk, talk to me a little bit about what is that maturation process? Because a lot of times when my when my dad would say something like, well, you just, you're not old enough yet to appreciate this, I was offended. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. But now I kind of understand what he was saying. Tell me a little bit about what is that maturation process musically from a jazz perspective? You bring up some points, Galen, that are germane. That is to say, I dare that person who considers herself or himself a jazz fan has not gone through the same thing. So for people like been around for a while, I'm reasonably confident that they've experienced the same thing. So, you know, again, I was fortunate since that I got baptized, if you will, a little bit earlier than probably most people do. So for me, I was already hip to kind of blue sketches of Spain, you know, and on and on. So when, when bitches grew hearing that, for me, it was kind of a natural progression because at that time, we talk about college years where, and again, so a lot of music I took to college. Uh, and the college I went to was predominantly white. So I took music that uh, many of the brothers were listening to. And so the white cast was like, man, how do you know about this? Right? It's like in terms of what they were listening to, like rock and that, that type of thing. So Bitches Brew was no surprise to me, in part because I don't know if you've heard along that same line as Bitches Brew, Miles Davis has a recording called Jack Johnson. And if you haven't heard Jack Johnson, or uh, when you hear Jack Johnson, I, I think Jack Johnson came first. But it's like, it puts things in a historical context. So when you listen to Jack Johnson, no, Bitches Brew came first, I'm sorry. Uh, and then later on, when you hear Jack Johnson, it all makes sense because you understand it's part of the historical continuum. Now, in terms of the maturational process that you described, you, you know that that's an, a subjective individual experience. 
let's just say, you know, we can get five people lined up. And over the course, if we were doing, it was the academic part coming out, if we were going to do a longitudinal study, if you will, those five people listen to the same song at different intervals throughout a 10, 15 year period. Well, because of their subjective nature, they're going to interpret and feel those songs in different ways. So person A may may expand her palate far beyond, right? And then person B may be like, oh, I, I like what we started, you know, when, you know, five years ago, and I'm not really open to listening listen to anything else. So it's kind of a difficult question because in general, that uh, that maturation, as you call it, is different for everybody. For me, it was just a natural progression because I was soaking up all types of music, whether it was like European classical, Parliament Funkadelic, who's one of my, aside, this is a side note, aside from Duke Ellington, who, if I'm not mistaken, between he and Billy Strayhorn, they have like 2,000 plus documented compositions. So outside of Duke Ellington and Billy Strayhorn, I think George Clinton is the most prolific composer for various reasons. But again, I had all these different types of experiences. So my maturational process, as you described it, was probably a little different than my friend. Clearly it was different from my friend because I was turning them on to music and they were like, man, where did you get this? And then older people, they're like, you're young to know about Charles Mingus, right? <sighs> or blind, it feels blues, blind, lemon, Jefferson. You ain't supposed to know nothing about this. You know, it's been a wonderful journey, but my experience for all intents and purposes has been unique in terms of musically. Hey, it's not too late. Hit that subscribe button so you're sure to catch the next episode. If you're really enjoying the vibe, leave us a review or become a VIP for guests and show exclusives. Cheers.